Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope the evening will be uh, informative and uh, I, I also hope uh, inspiring. Uh, my, my feeling for what we're trying to achieve with our SBC Baccalaureate is that this is a, a huge opportunity for our students. As, as always, we will begin with an acknowledgement of country. And so in recognition of the unique place the First Peoples of this land have in our nation, and in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that our place of learning rests on Wurundjeri land. We honour the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, both past and present, for their stewardship of the land and dedication to teaching their culture and traditions. We recognise the inherent dignity of all people and value the contribution of all cultures to the rich tapestry of our nation. And beginning with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all truth, I spend so much time thinking, planning, and worrying about my life. Your word says that although we plan our course in our hearts, it's you who establishes our steps. Help me to make you the centre of my planning. I can do nothing without you giving me the strength to do it. I can plan nothing without you giving me guidance to plan it. The desires of my heart can only truly be satisfied in you. Direct my steps, Lord. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, here's our agenda, so I'll be throwing shortly to uh, our principal, Dr. Davies, to give you a brief address before we go into the presentation proper and you can see uh, the main topics that we'll be covering today. And so uh, now I would like to hand over to Dr. Davies. Thank you, Dr. Davies. Thank you, Mr. Reedy, and welcome everyone on this blustery Melbourne evening. And um, look, I hope everything is going well with you in version 6.0. And unfortunately, you would have heard that we're, we're heading into another week, and I'll be writing tomorrow just to confirm that. But but safe in the knowledge that we know what we're doing. You know, unfortunately, we've done this six times now. We know exactly what the playbook is, and we can make this happen. And, and I hope your, your young men feel that they're secure in, in what they're doing and and taking out of these classes as much as they possibly can. I think the important things that they, they need to understand at the minute is that, that we, both the, the parents and their teachers, we're the rock for them. So we're giving them stability, we're giving them surety throughout the week, and we're giving them that, that, that routine that they can follow throughout the week because we can control the controllables. We'll put the ambiguity aside and we will cope with that as, as the... Uh, as the adults and make sure that they've got that absolute um, firm knowledge of what they're doing week to week. The other part and what tonight is about as well is, is the future is not disappearing and, and the future is going to be very, very bright for our young people. And, and if we keep up rolling our sleeves, literally and figuratively, we'll make sure that their futures are very much coming forward as quickly as possible. So what's important tonight? We pride ourselves at. We pride ourselves at St Bernard's on uh, giving the very, very best education so we get the best out of every single young person in our care. So we want to find the best version of them. And that's what's important to us. We know we, we're not a cookie cutter school. We're not a school that we want everyone to be the same. We want to find the best version of your son and enable that to come out. So he walks out of here the very best version of himself. And part of that is, you know, it might be a linear yeah, a VC pathway. It might be, and Mr. Reedy will talk about this more than me. It might be an applied learning pathway. But we felt that there was something else. There was something missing. That that spot where the the our young people who want to go to university but perhaps don't want to follow a VC pathway. They want to have some some variation, other things in their in their lives, and bring that into their school lives. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. So we've worked very hard, and, and I will uh, acknowledge Mark Reedy's work in this. He's been spectacular in working with our partners at RMIT and putting this package together. We're very, very confident that we've got something in here which will make a huge difference, not only for our young men in next year, but moving on into the future and their lives in academia throughout, uh, sorry, after school. So without further ado, I want to thank you for, for tuning in this evening. We've got the uh, the ability to ask questions in our in our chat room, so the possibility for you to, to ask those questions, and we'll we'll either answer them this evening as we go through. If we can't answer them this evening, 
we'll get back to you. So without uh, any more ado from me, I will pass back to Mark Reedy and I'll say a few words at the end. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Dr. Davies. Um, so moving on, I wanted to begin by just talking a little bit about uh, what would be a typical uh, approach to year 12, which is you, you get to the end of it and the question on everyone's lips is, what was your ATAR? And typically you get some responses like this. And the feedback is fantastic, 99, that's in the top 1%. You can uh, choose whatever you want. Uh, you might get the response like this, which is, oh, well done, top 20%. Um, and then we have responses in, in this vein with perhaps not the verbalization, but the, mm, I hope you get an offer with that. And so one of the things that we really need to focus on, I suppose, in, in terms of offering an alternative pathway for, for students who might not be uh, on target to get the highest of ATARs, is there a way that we can support them in, in what they're trying to achieve, but also prepare them even better for this? And so an understanding of how the ATAR works um, would be fairly important. And so essentially, um, as you may or may not be aware, the ATAR isn't uh, a percentage score. It's a, a ranking uh, where you're saying um, people who have this particular ATAR have done better than this much percentage of uh, the other people who did the year 12. And so for example, here at 99.95%, these are the people who have done better than essentially 99.95% of all the other students. And interestingly enough, one of the questions that often comes up here is, well, why can't you get an ATAR of 100? And the reason is, if you get an ATAR of 100, then you've done better than 100% of all the other students, including yourself, which uh, is uh, a bit of a paradox that people don't want to delve into. So. 99.95%, um, you've done better than virtually every other person in the state. And you can see that uh, we've got this uh, bit here in the middle where most of the students are, and that is effectively an ATAR of 50. Reminds me of the joke about the politicians who get so uh, wound up when they're told that uh, half the population is below average intelligence and they start to rail against the education system. Essentially, the ATAR is a ranking process and if students are doing better than 50% of uh, the rest of the, of the year 12 cohort, they get an ATAR of 50. Um, in my discussions with your sons, I pointed out that realistically uh, to get into a university course, you need to be doing uh, about 50 or better. And realistically, the better you do in ATAR, the more likely you are to be able to pick and choose the courses that you want. And so effectively, 99.95, you can walk into any course you want. Um, so I'm not here to suggest that the ATAR isn't important for those boys who are strongly academic, it's really important for them. Question you might be asking now is, um, what does a 50 mean in terms of my academic performance? And given that we're looking here at 50 as being essentially the average, and when we do assessment in schools, we typically look at uh, a C plus as being the average. Effectively, what that means is if your son is getting less than C's, he's not going to get an ATAR of 50 or better. Now, with all the best will in the world, it's not going to happen. And, you know, we can have all sorts of uh, statements that, uh, you know, when it's really important, we'll do better. Um, but the reality is the, the background uh, foundations and, and the, the study that goes into building a really high ATAR 
has to be set up pretty early on. So last year we had uh, COVID and there was all sorts of um, changes that had to be made and we, we're still experiencing those similar um, arrangements having to be made where we're chopping and changing and uh, assessment is being moved around. And so last year this started to happen where Swinburne University said, let's not worry about ATARs, we'll just go with what does your school say about whether you're a suitable person for this and they're, they're allowing people in. And it's tempting to think of these sorts of things as being, um, you know, just because of our current situation. But in actual fact, this has actually been brewing for quite some time. This graphic shows, uh, going back uh, to 2014, how uh, offers of undergraduate study have been handed out depending on, first of all, ATAR band, and they're the coloured bands at the bottom. And as you can see, the, the higher your, uh, your ATAR, so the little light blue one in the middle there, the more likely you are to be offered a, uh, an undergraduate course. When you get down to the red bit at the bottom, which is 50 or less, you can see that you know very few students get to university based on an ATAR of uh, 50 or less. The interesting thing for me though is the grey band at the top, which is those offers of undergraduate study for people who don't have an ATAR, people who are not in year 12. And clearly we're going back quite some time here. And so this is not a new thing that the ATAR isn't the be all and end all of getting into university. And it's uh, something that people in educational circles have been aware of for quite some time. And there's been a lot of discussion about is the ATAR moving towards um, a situation that becomes less relevant. Um, I would certainly say it's not irrelevant if you're looking to um, get guaranteed entry into highly prestigious courses, but it's not the only thing that is used by universities for this. And so I think Dr. Alan Finkel says it very clearly. As educators, we know that the ATAR is a, a tool that is used to rank students and, and allocate places. Students, and, and to a large extent, I, I suspect parents also though, treat the ATAR as the goal. The, the idea, the very purpose of completing year 12 is to get an ATAR. And I can understand why parents would think that. Uh, certainly the way the media talks about the ATAR as, uh, as being so terrifically important uh, and suggests virtually that failure to get a good ATAR is essentially dooming you to a life of struggle and misery. And, and reality is that uh, in, in this day and age, nothing could be further from the truth. Here's uh, a graphic from uh, 2016, which illustrates the idea that um, in 2016, only one in every four enrolments in uh, undergraduate degrees came from students who got an ATAR. Um, and as you work your way around, you can see that um, a number of them came from people who've completed their secondary education without an ATAR, 11%. 26% uh, were getting their um, enrolment because they've already completed some sort of extra degree, so a diploma or something like that. Um, and you can see that there's a few that come in from mature age uh, applications and quite a significant number come from VET courses, which might surprise people. Uh, but the reality is there are numerous, numerous pathways to get into a, an undergraduate degree. While I was researching all of this though, I, I came across this statistic, which I find to be really interesting. And it sort of taps into some of the concerns that we've had for a while about our students who are 
getting through their BCE and, and doing uh, their exams and ending up with an ATAR that is below, say, 50 or 60, and our concerns about how they might cope with uh, the move into tertiary in the tertiary environment. And I think it's really instructive that people who do end up entering a university course with a low ATAR, so they manage to get into a course, tend to drop out at a greater rate. And you can see that uh, obviously the higher the ATAR that students get, the more likely they are to stay. And that's probably because to get a high ATAR, you need to have developed really strong um, study habits and uh, the work ethic that's really high powered. And those sort of boys would be working huge hours to, to get themselves, clawing themselves to the top of the heap. Um, students who are not used to those sorts of uh, work habits or who are not naturally gifted may tend to struggle and moving into a university course with a low ATAR does tend to lead to a higher level of uh, dropping out. The, the thing that I find really important here is that uh, of those who do get into university, those who are, uh, end up there without an ATAR are less likely to drop out than those who get an ATAR below 60, which is interesting. And from there, my thoughts were, can we set up a program that makes this dropping out rate even less likely? In other words, we improve that retention rate and, and make sure that those boys who end up in a university course are more likely to stay there. And this leads us to what we're talking about tonight, which is uh, the idea of really searching out, I suppose, an opportunity to develop the very skills that you will need as you enter university, rather than just being in a classroom where you're developing skills about how to best answer questions relating to geography, for example. Instead of doing that, we're now actually focused on when we get to university, what sort of skills will you need and how can we make sure that you have those in place already? Which leads us, of course, to um, our idea of the St. Uh, St Bernard's Baccalaureate. So what we're saying is, we will get you completing your VCE certificate, um, but we'll also incorporate an opportunity to undertake an RMIT course. In order to fit that in, the, and we'll talk more about logistics in a minute, but the RMIT course is going to take two days a week for you to complete. And so in order to fit that in, we can't run your VCE certificate in the same way that it's normally run at school, which is over five days and typically five subjects. And what we're looking for now is to drop back the requirements for your VC certificate to the bare minimum. In other words, to complete your year 12, you will need to do four subjects, a, a total of eight units of unit three, four level uh, study. And in order to get your certificate, you do need to be doing English. And as a Catholic school, we do want you to do um, some RE. And so we're saying, our VCE course for the SBC Baccalaureate is English and the Certificate 3 in Community Service, which as a full subject will count towards your VCE. And then we're offering a choice of two further subjects from the list that's here. So further mathematics, vet business, vet sport and recreation, or if you're already doing an external non-trade vet, um, that you should uh, continue with that. Because we're looking at probably a small cohort, we're not in a position to offer a wide range of um, opportunities uh, in terms of different subjects. And the subjects that we have chosen here have been chosen because they're easy for students to pick up at year 12 without having done the year 11 versions of them. Of course, if, if uh, a year 11 student already is taking those anyway, that, that makes the transition easier, but it's certainly not vital. 
And so students coming out of year 11, whatever, whatever um, subjects they're studying, can pick up the, the, the BCE part of the baccalaureate and still complete their BCE certificate. In order to make sure we've got the time frames we need to allow the RMIT part of this course to work though, what we're looking at is needing to drop back the amount of period allocation for these subjects, which means that uh, the best way to approach these would be as uh, an unscored approach to these subjects. But we're not, we're deliberately now not looking for an ATAR. Um, and bear in mind my discussion earlier that the ATAR is not the be all and end all and is not necessary for gaining entry to university courses. So what we're doing is we're, we're compressing the amount of time to allow time for our RMIT component of this, but making sure that our students are able to complete a VCE certificate. Which brings me to the RMIT part of this. But as well as completing your VCE certificate, students will be completing a certificate for in tertiary preparation. And to my mind, this is the real guts of what we're trying to get across to people. And, and I think the real opportunity that presents itself here. So every student undertaking the tertiary preparation course will do five core units. So it's, it's all the same, but these ones are focused specifically on those skills that students will need to succeed at university. And they'll also be doing five units from a choice of areas. And this is the bit that I really like. A number of universities have a, a, a certificate for in tertiary preparation as a bridging course for students who, for whatever reason, haven't finished year 12 at all. Um, the RMIT version is the only one that we've seen which has not just a, a broad strokes approach that everyone does, but an opportunity to actually specialise a little bit in preparation to moving into RMIT courses. And so the options in terms of the streams would be in business, science or engineering. Now, a key part of all of this is that the RMIT uh, people would view their certificate in tertiary preparation as having an ATAR equivalent of 54. In other words, it's, it's a, a, completing this essentially gives you an above average ATAR. Logistics around this. One of the key things that we really wanted to ensure was that the students undertaking the SBC baccalaureate are still and feel like they're still St Bernard students. Uh, we want them to be able to be involved in all of the things that are typically really precious for Year 12 students coming through. They've had five years of being part of a really tight knit community. They, and we don't want them to lose that. And I know that they don't want to lose it either. And so we have three days a week here at St Bernard's and we've specifically noted to RMIT that we want our boys on Wednesdays and Fridays. Wednesdays because it allows them to be involved in ACC sport, which is a significant part for a number of our students. Really, really important for them to be part of those final opportunities to represent the school. And Fridays are the days where we have those really critical community celebration days. Um, St Bernard's Day, where we're off uh, doing our, or Edmund Rice Day, where we're off doing our um, um, our walk through through the parks, where we have our assemblies, where we do our major liturgies, all those things that form our community tend to happen on Fridays. The remaining day uh, is still in negotiation. Um, in talking with uh, Dr Davies, we were thinking it would probably be Monday. Um, so that sort of gives the boys an opportunity to be sort of continually connecting uh, with the school, but also then two days a week at RMIT City Campus. Um, and so a couple of things just to be aware of with the RMIT side of things. Um, because 
RMIT is a, a huge organisation. We're talking 50,000 students, um, properties all over the place. They will develop a timetable specifically for us, for our students, and they will be our students will be taught as a group. So not uh, joining in with other RMIT uh, students. So they're setting up a program specifically for us. Because of that, but also because um, their, their lecturers will need to be involved in other classes uh, and we're, we're sort of limiting them to specific days. There will be times when there is, uh, I suppose, variation in start and finish times that, that may happen. So uh, on some classes, the, the boys may need to be there for an 8.30 start. Uh, which shouldn't be too much of a trial because we nearly pretty much expect them in St Bernard's at that time. Be aware though that there may be some times when uh, the classes will finish a little bit later. Um, and so the boys will get a real sense of being a tertiary student while still being with us for a lot of the time. Um, the important aspects of all of this, I suppose, is we're looking at this group as a uh, a standalone group uh, where we'll have a St Bernard's timetable which will be de developed around them and then an RMIT timetable which will be developed around them and the opportunity I suppose to straddle that environment from um, students to essentially young adult and the opportunity to experience the uh, being involved at a, in a university campus and when you then move to RMIT later on it's not the overwhelming experience that it often is for first year students. Uh, these boys will be uh, very well used to being on campus, finding their way around and interacting with the staff and other students there. A little bit more about uh, the, the tertiary preparation course. Um, you can see here that there's sort of four courses that really do focus on the sort of skills that I'll need. Um, and you know, skills that are quite different to the skills that typically are developed during your VCE. Um, and there'll be opportunities to sort of, uh, because it's a certificate for, uh, it approaches things in the applied learning way, uh, real opportunities to practice these skills and develop them along the line. I'll also point out the very last one there is, is probably a critical one, which I'll come back to later. Um, one of the core units is actually conducting the research needed to plan your way through RMIT. And I'll come back to that because it, it does bring up a point about how you then proceed from our baccalaureate into RMIT. Um, here's the two of the options that are available in terms of the other five units that students might choose. So there's a business stream which sort of deals with um, some of those critical skills around developing business concepts. Um, there's the engineering stream which as its name suggests, will lead to engineering uh, degrees. Um, and you'll notice that all of them have some sort of mathematical basis to them. Uh, so uh, the business stream is working with mathematical techniques and the engineering one is applying mathematical techniques in engineering environments. Um, the science stream is a little more complex in that there are a total of seven units and you would uh, only be doing five of them, two of them you have to do, and then there are some choices. The, the choices are probably critical in terms of uh, some of the pathways. And so being, uh, being able to sort of work through the planning process for deciding, okay, which of these units will I need in order to get to where I want, um, the, the maths for the science stream is actually important. And you can see there, I've noted that the second maths that's listed there is a prerequisite for the associate degree in applied science. It's the only one that actually has that uh, prerequisite notation though. 
And so you can see that there's opportunities to, uh, even within the science stream, start to specialise into the different ty uh, types of sciences that are there. My brother always talks to me about the fact that when you're doing a proposal, you need to have a WIFM statement. Uh, what's in it for me? Why would I do this? And uh, there's a couple of critical points, I think. We want our students to graduate with a VC certificate, and this program will allow that to happen. As well as that, all of our students will get at least one VET certificate three, and if they've been working in VET subjects in year 11, they'll end up with up to three of these uh, at the end of their year 12 work. They'll have a, a certificate four on top of that with an ATAR equivalent of 54. They will get guaranteed entry into most, not all, and we'll talk about that in a minute, most RMIT courses. And by guaranteed, I mean just that, guaranteed entry. Uh, and the ones that are not guaranteed aren't cut off um, if you can use your certificate for as the ATAR equivalent and you're within the cutoff for those degrees, you'll use that certificate to get into there. For me though, the, the real um, key points are the last two, the guaranteed entry into RMIT, but also this opportunity to step away from being a school student and practice and develop into being a tertiary student. And there are significant differences and this opportunity to experience that, be involved in a tertiary lifestyle and a tertiary um, education, I think is actually really critical um, and will prepare our boys really well for that transition, whether it's at RMIT or somewhere else. Now, I know that you can't see what this says. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here, and we'll delve into each of these, is the breadth of the opportunities that present themselves to our boys once they've completed this. Um, it, it really is quite um, quite diverse in terms of what they can what they can move into. I spent a an enjoyable weekend trawling through the RMIT website to establish exactly what opportunities exist from this pathway. So let's deal with the science stream. And again, hopefully this is uh, clear enough to you. It may be small, too small to see. I hope it's not. Essentially, what we're saying is if students have completed the uh, certificate four, and I, I would say here, never mind whether they've completed the VC or not, if they've completed the certificate four, RMIT will guarantee them options such as getting into the associate degree in applied science, uh, working in a, a certificate for in lab tech, which then leads into diplomas and bachelor degrees, nursing, um, conservation and land management, which then leads into all sorts of opportunities, including things like um, landscape and architectural design, environmental science in various um, key areas, even dentistry, uh, the uh, diploma in dental technology, and then moving into the uh, advanced diploma of dental prosthetics. There's, there's real opportunities for people uh, who have a science bent. Business is, uh, the business stream is quite expansive. Um, so I might say that I had to go in for some color coding. And so, and again, I, I appreciate this is small, but the bands that are shown in green here will be effectively having any of the options that are shown in the bottom area where the little green um, notation is at the bottom. Any of those options can be accessed from the business stream. And the orange ones, uh, any of the options that are shown on the right of that uh, graphic at the bottom can be accessed from within the business stream. And I think you can see that there's a uh, huge variation there. So things like uh, accountancy, um, 
digital business, economics and finance, um, a number of double degrees, uh, particularly in the orange side of that. So plenty of opportunities for boys to expand and move into different areas. Uh, and in also in part there, some of the IT options come out of that. So uh, for example, the Diploma of uh, Information Technology, which then leads into Bachelor of Information Technology degrees. I must say, when I first heard of this one, I was uh, surprised that we would be able to get kids into an engineering degree, but here it is. Uh, the engineering stream has an enormous array of potential engineering pathways for students um, to, to, um, to take up. And you can perhaps see why one of the core units from the Certificate 4 is planning your pathway, because it's, it's um, uh, almost a bewildering array of options that sort of stem from this. One of the concerns that I'm, I'm sure features for people is, OK, what if I don't want to do something in business, engineering or, or science? Can I do anything about this? Um, and the answer is, yes, you can. The key part of the stream process, though, is that that is the guaranteed pathways. Um, so if you're doing the certificate four, you will be guaranteed entry into those pathways. If the uh, the options there aren't really what you're after, you are able to apply for um, pathways that are outside of those streams. Just be aware, though, that these these uh, options outside the streams are not guaranteed, and by that we mean not that you can't do them, but those pathways are open to a competitive process. In other words, the applicants are ranked according to their abilities, and there is a cutoff point uh, in terms of um, ATARs. And your question might be, well, I haven't got an ATAR. How will I get into one of these? Keep in mind, RMIT view their certificate for is equivalent to an ATAR of 54. So if you apply to, for example, the associate degree in business, the indicative ATAR for that for RMIT is an ATAR of 46.7. In other words, an ATAR of 46.7 is the ATAR that they will guarantee you'll get a, a slot at that uh, degree. Your certificate for is well above that as an indicative ATAR of 54. Uh, it gets in by at least seven points. Um, the other options that are shown here are just examples, but um, one of the queries I had was, can I get into um, architecture doing this? And the answer is switching from the certificate for having done that and then going into a certificate for design leads into an advanced diploma of building design architecture, which leads into a Bachelor of Architectural Design or a number of other options. Undertaking the associate degree in business leads you into law. Um, undertaking a diploma of teacher education preparation leads you into education. And one of the key parts about this is once you're in this system, as you complete further study, your nominal ATAR goes up. So completing the certificate four as part of our baccalaureate is a nominal ATAR of 54. If you then use that to complete a diploma, RMIT regard that as a nominal ATAR of 72. If you use the certificate four to get into an advanced diploma and you complete that, RMIT regard that as a nominal ATAR of 81. So even if you're then using these diplomas or advanced diplomas as a tool for applying for um, degrees that are outside of any of these guaranteed pathways, your, your nominal ATAR will be sufficient to get you into them. And so it's, it's a case of 
navigating your way through and taking advantage of the fact that once you're in the system, what you're doing is applying for courses with a piece of paper that says, one, you've got an ATAR of either 54 or 72 or 81, but more than that, you've shown that you are a successful tertiary student. In other words, you are the real deal. And the reality is that the ATARs that are shown as cutoff points for degrees is typically not the only thing that universities take into account. And, and this would be one of those, those processes that provide more opportunities than you might think. Uh, I do, I, you know, the, the stressful part of this, of course, is that if you step outside of the streams, you're, you're no longer guaranteed and it's a competitive process. The, uh, the baccalaureate puts you on a strong competitive uh, footing, but if, for example, a huge number of students suddenly decided to apply for a particular course, you might find that the ATAR cutoff for that goes up. Um, it, it's, it's possible, uh, and I'd stress there that it's, it's about guaranteed versus not. Another concern that people might have is, if I do this, am I uh, locked into um, being at, sorry, I've skipped over, I'll skip back to that. Am I locked into studying in RMIT? And the answer to that is no. Um, again, many other universities have their own tertiary preparation courses, but naturally they would recognise RMITs. And the RMIT staff have uh, made it clear that part of their process would be assisting you with planning and applying and even going so far as to writing letters of recommendation as part of their process of getting you towards pathways that are outside their own courses. Which of course leads to, okay, what is the process for applying? And this I think is another real benefit of being in the baccalaureate is that you're already an RMIT student. And so you don't need to apply through VTAC. You make a direct, a direct application to RMIT with your paper from RMIT saying you are a capable and successful tertiary student already. And we'll note there, I'm talking again about one of the core units where you're conducting your research about your further studies. The staff for this unit will actually be your contact uh, to organise your application. So you will know already the person that you're going to be working with to, to apply for your courses. A couple of things to, to think about though. This is a new program uh, and RMIT are for working to develop the program for us. And so in a similar way to uh, St Bernard's, we, we can't run every possible subject if we don't have the number of students that we need to run the classes. Um, and we typically put um, a, a lower limit on whether we run class or not, around 15. And unsurprisingly, RMIT do the same thing. They have to staff this, they have to provide the, the lecturers to work with you. And so they need minimum numbers um, because they're putting this on for us. We're limiting them to two days, two specific days, whereas under normal circumstances, they would be able to run these classes at any time during the week. And so these have to be run for us. And so they're saying we need for each stream to run, we need 15 students in each one, which means that if we want to be able to run all three streams, we need to get at least 45 students. Now, if we fall short of this number, then it doesn't mean the program won't run, but we wouldn't be able to run all three streams. And so we need to be considering, okay, which ones are the ones that are the most popular, I suppose. Cost. Um, RMIT are an external provider, so it, it costs money in the same way that uh, students going off to um, external TAFE courses costs money. Uh, we're currently negotiating with RMIT around this. Um, at the moment, they're regarding our students as full fee paying students. We're hopeful that we can negotiate around that. 
Um, because it's a new program, we can say though that the next year we will cover the cost of this while we bid down the arrangements uh, for this. Going forward, uh, this would probably be uh, sort of transferred into a similar arrangement for what we've got for our VET courses, which would be a co-payment uh, from parents to take advantage of this. In a similar way though to what happens with VET courses though, if a student changes their mind and drops out from the VET, we, we're not in a position to just absorb those costs. And so uh, we ask parents to make up that cost difference and we'd have to apply the same process here if there were students who initially said, yes, yes, this is a really good option for me, I want to do this, then change their minds after the courses commenced and, and pulled out, um, we would need to look at observe, recouping those costs. So just factor that into your thinking. Some other, not so much issues, but things to be aware of. Um, what you can see here is that university timelines generally don't match up extremely well with secondary school ones. There's, there's lots of overlap, but it's not a complete mesh up. Now, here I'm using uh, the dates from this year as an example, so that we get a sense of how this might play out. But you can see here that uh, this year, we started our term on 29th of January, whereas RMIT started their first semester on the 8th of February, a week later. Um, and so what we would say here is this actually is, is not an issue because it presents us with the ideal time for us to run orientation days at RMIT. When we take the students in, they'll be, they'll be beginning their VCE course with us and then on the days where they would usually be going to RMIT because RMIT hasn't started yet, we'd be taking them in and basically orientating them around the campus at RMIT and getting them used to going in and out and finding where they have to go. Universities tend not to have uh, term breaks. They, they work in semesters, but they do have a bit of a break in the middle of the semester just to give the students uh, uh, some time, downtime. Typically it's one week, whereas of course schools tend to have two weeks. And so you can see that the mid-semester break for RMIT is uh, the first part of April uh, and our term holidays go for an extra week. And so what would happen there is uh, students would have time off during our, um, our school part of the holidays, but uh, when RMIT goes back, they would be still attending RMIT for two days of that week. Again, uh, when we look at the semester break, you'll see that um, the university has a three week break, starting a little bit earlier than schools who have a two week break. And um, I would be hoping for some time there where we can do uh, something that we, we want and we encourage all of our year 12 students to do and that's be involved in the year 12 retreats. And so this would be an ideal time for our uh, baccalaureate students to have their retreat in the two days that are spare um, while the university is um, on holidays and we're not. You can see that we come back together again at the start of the semester two where our term three starts on the same day as the semester two begins. Interestingly enough, for some reason, um, RMIT has a very early short mid-semester break and then we've got um, no time off um, while we're on term holidays for term three. And so students would for two days every week of the holidays be going into RMIT. You'll note that we're able to have the boys with us for the year 12 final day. And then as our year 12 uh, VCE cohort go into SWAT back and prepare for their exams. Our baccalaureate boys would continue with their St. Bernard's classes and their RMIT classes um, 
with them finishing on the 12th of November, about a week before the exams finish. Um, and so while the mismatch is there, it presents opportunities for us to do some things that we think are actually really important. Just sort of winding up here, um, the important things about the baccalaureate, I think uh, we've already discussed, but I'm putting here three things that I think are actually really important. The, the baccalaureate, it, it is an opportunity not just do the VCE because that's what everyone does. Yes, you'll have the VCE certificate, but you'll also have at least one other certificate, three and a certificate four. Um, which means that you have essentially more qualifications leaving St Bernard's than you would if you were running just a normal VC certificate or even undertaking an applied learning pathway. It is very much a lower pressure pathway to tertiary studies in that it takes out that stress of exams and the stress of having to be in a competitive position all the way through the year where you're uh, struggling to achieve the best you can compared to everyone else. Um, a non-scored approach and the certificate four approach is not about uh, seeking high results, it's showing competence, being able to complete the skills. Um, the Possibly the most valuable part of this is that introduction, that early introduction to tertiary life and those, those first steps to um, undertaking tertiary life by being at the campus for a couple of days a week and, and becoming used to being there. A couple of things though that the baccalaureate is not, and I think it's really important that we're stressing this, this is not in any way, shape or form, a no work option or an easy option. Um, it's a year 12 certificate. And you can't expect to walk away with a year 12 certificate without doing any work. Um, and the key points throughout the year will be for the VCE still around. Have you completed the work that shows you understand the areas of study for each of these play, each of these subjects that you're doing? And in the same way, the RMIT course will be, have you shown that you can do the things that we're asking you to do? And so there will be assessment of that going through, but there will not be end of year exams, for example. Um, and I think that it's something that students in particular really need to focus on. Um, it, it's not a case of I'll get a certificate by just sitting in a room and doing not very much and they'll give me a certificate at the end. And then I'll go to university and I won't do much there, but they'll give me a degree at the end of that. And then I'll get a job where I won't do much at my job and they'll give me money at the end of that. It's not how life works. And um, the reality is that whichever way, whichever pathway you approach, there's going to be a need for people to work and work to the best of their ability. The other thing that the baccalaureate is not is a risky option. I know that um, the way the media portrays the ATAR as being the be all and end all makes people nervous if we start talking about no ATAR, but this is not a risky option. This is a guaranteed pathway into a myriad of opportunities for, for your sons. Now, I'm going to now just pass back to uh, Dr. Davies just to wind things up. Thank you for your attendance and your attention, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Thank you, everyone. And uh, look, I, I hope you get the sense of excitement that we we have for this. We 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 thought all the way along what we want for for your sons, for our young men. We want them to be at St. Bernard's. We want them to to experience the fullness of life that we have at the college. We want them to have 
uh, an experience that, that is great when they're here, but to qualify for university, the baccalaureate, to, to go on to higher degrees, but to do that in a way that that is different to a VC. You know, we want to give some, some of our young men don't want the pressure cooker at VC and this gives them that. So I want to congratulate Mark Reedy in the extraordinary work he's done. And again, I'll, I'll thank publicly here, our partners at RMIT because they've been superb in looking at what we want and, and adjusting what they offer to enable our young people to, to go on and try this for next year. So next steps from here, you've heard from Mark. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from your young men. We'd love for you to be uh, involved in this and we look very much forward to walking with you in partnership as we do always down this next pathway. So I thank you for attendance this evening and be be safe, be uh, be connected out there and look forward to at some point seeing you face to face at the college. Thanks for attending everyone.